So welcome everybody um, to this um, third and final keynote address, which is with Mary James Gill. It's a pleasure to have Mary here with us today. Um, and I'll let to Andres, uh, the chair of the session, introduce Mary properly after this brief introductory note. So um, as I say, this is the, the keynote address on the third day of the Sanitation Workers Forum. And we're joined with Mary, who will be here to talk about her work um, in Pakistan, um, followed by a brief question, answer and discussion um, with Mary today. Just uh, to note again, if anyone would like to have um, French interpretation, so English to French interpretation, we do have this uh, enabled with our uh, wonderful interpreters here today. So you can click on the interpretation tab uh, to enable that. So without further ado, I'd like to pass over to the event uh, to the chair, um, Andres Sueso, to introduce Mary and to introduce the keynote today. Thanks, Andres. Thanks, Ali, and thanks everybody for joining. I'm um, Andres Rosa Gonzalez from uh, World Trade and also part of the Initiative for Sanitation Workers. And I'm honored to be here today to introduce uh, Mary James Gill um, and her keynote speech on humanizing sanitation workers in Pakistan. Mary James Gill is a politician, human rights lawyer and activist. Um, she's a graduate in political science and history and now pursuing a master's degree in public policy and governance. She was also elected as a member of Punjab Assembly for the 2013-2018 tenure. Coming from a humble Christian family herself, she has been working on minority issues for more than a decade now, and she's currently serving as executive director of the Center for Law and Justice, a research-based policy advocacy and development organization. She is also the founder of Pakistan's first advocacy campaign on sanitation workers called Sweepers as Superheroes, which aims to raise awareness of sewer and waste workers' dignity safety and social protection. She is also the co-author of Pakistan's pioneer research study titled Shame and Stigma in Sanitation, Competing Faiths and Compromised Dignity, Safety and Employment Security of Sanitation Workers in Pakistan. So her extensive work has had lots of impact at the local, national and international level and the list would be very, very long, but as an example, she has had um, the, the work and the, her work and the campaign has um, been covered in many high-profile me media outlets, such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Al Jazeera, to name a few. And the campaign, her, the research, and her tireless efforts have also been recognized several times, including in Hot 100 for 2020 by Hello Pakistan magazine, and with Sweden's prestigious Annalyn Prize in 2020. And I'm sure this won't be the, the last. Uh, personally, I also have um, enjoyed uh, collaborating with, with Mary James on, on this topic, and she is always um, a source of inspiration and, and admiration. So it's uh, really an, an honor to, to share this. And um, I will pass it um, over to, to her for her, her keynote on the dignity and safety of sanitation workers and, and how important it is uh, to bring that human lens um, Thanks very much, and over to you, Mary. Thank you, Andres. It is an honor indeed. And thank you, Sally, for giving me this incredible opportunity through Sanitation Workers Forum to, to be part of this, this um, initiative. Uh, but I would like to start with what uh, Professor Miriam Anthony, uh, an, an American anthropologist and missionary, uh, observed in her God's Foreign Policy, Practical Ways to Help the World's Poor in 1984. Being a Christian in Pakistan may be breathtaking in quite a different sense. It may mean cleaning up other people's urine and bowel moment for the rest of one's lives. And I would also like to share um, back then it was uh, it is very vivid in my memory until even now. On June 4th, 2017, it was a Sunday. And uh, on my Facebook, the first thing I saw was a post of a sanitation worker at Fan Masih's deaths in Umarkot, interiors in Pakistan, who had died a couple of days ago. The doctors had refused to treat him because he was covered with filth and they were fasting as it was the month of Ramadan. 
but when he was brought to the hospital after inhaling poisonous gases while working in a manhole. Not only Christians, but Muslims were quietly quite outraged at this inhuman treatment by the doctors. But former crisp, you know, Gujarat district police officer, Suhail Zafar Chatha, he uniquely condemned this act. He posted on Facebook, in solidarity with their pharmacy, hashtag I'm Chura. And I, without thinking much, posted out my Facebook wall. Yes, I'm Chura and I'm proud of it. Nothing changed, but everything changed. The next few days, filths kept pouring onto my post. The backlash was mainly from the Christian community. And I had no idea that hatred of this expression is so deeply rooted. This changed me forever. And I still feel ashamed that I didn't speak for thousands of her pharmacies before that. Punjab Lok Lok uh, uh, a local organization uh, digital, on digital media that supported my stance. And uh, Abdul Salam Rathor, he created a video on this backlash. Salam also introduced me to the images and footages of manual scavengers in India, which were also added to my video. Those images were agonizing, but sadly, there were no images of sewer cleaners from Pakistan. They were invisible to our society. I had come to know about this hatred about two years ago while I was working with my longtime colleague and friend, um, Asaf Akil. We were working on a policy document for the protection of religious minorities. It also included a campaign, Dignified Identity and Decent Occupation. It also included a proposal for banning those hateful words like Bhangi, Chura, NSI, which are usually primarily you know, used for, for Christians. In March 2018, I was appointed by the then Chief Minister. Shabash Sharif as the Minority Advisory Council Punjab, the only notified body for minorities in the province. We both had been working on legislative and policy recommendations for socioeconomic and political empowerment of minorities belonging to the backward classes. And various legislative issues were brought onto the council's agenda to have a coherent policy framework for minorities in the province. One of the significant issues that was surfaced was Punjab Health Department's policy, which clearly stated that only non-Muslims would be recruited for sanitation work. It was in that context that in September 2015, during a high profile meeting chaired by the then chief minister, I requested that the policy be struck down as it was discriminatory. Mr. Sharif was shocked to know this and ordered the health minister to strike it down in a month Chief Minister Strategic Reforms Unit, Salman Sufi, successfully got a notification issue to strike down these rules from the recruitment policy. But these ads keep coming up as these policies are not only restricted to one government department or province. We have recently been able to file a strategic litigation in the Honorable Supreme Court of Pakistan, challenging the state's discriminatory policies to recruit only non-Muslims, more specifically, only Christians as sweepers. But back in June 2017, I had no idea that associating myself with these workers would bring me this level of humiliation. However, it did not kill my compassion and empathy. And I decided that this must end and this must end now. I spoke with the waste management and sanitation authorities in Lahore and saw data on the deaths of those workers. The data collected from the Lahore waste management was another shock. At least 250 sanitation workers had died in past couple of years in this provincial capital, but there were hardly any incidents reported in the media. I lashed out on the floor of the house during my budget speech. My question was straightforward. The forefathers of Christians joined Pakistan because there was apparently no space for caste discrimination. It offered equality and social justice system, which Islam, had promised, but why is it continuing? There was no clear answer, but through various means, I urged the Punjab government that providing dignity and safety of sanitation workers was a prerequisite for achieving the ambitious agenda of WASH. 
Another hurdle in this work was the absence of data on sanitation workers. Even sanitation worker related pictures were for, from India. The powerful movement in India named Safai Karamchari Andolan resulted in federal legislation, the prohibition of employment as manual scavengers and the Rehabilitation Act 2013. This campaign helped me think of something similar in Pakistan to ban this barbaric practice. Before leaving for the State Department's Legislative Fellowship Program in 2017, I discussed with a couple of close friends who believed that the barbaric practice must be banned. Just like India, we should be able to do it through legislative means. And with the same, I prepared my action plan for the Legislative Fellowship and started the campaign to ban manual scavenging in Pakistan. However, my three weeks work placement in Philadelphia and with Social Innovation Institute Director Nick Torres and Citizen Diplomacy International, those were life-changing experiences. Meeting with CDUW at the Philadelphia Water Department and many Americans made me understand the safety of work issues mainly faced by African-Americans a few decades ago until the Memphis strike in April, 1968, which also laid down the foundation for a dramatic change. For me, the biggest concern was that what would be the alternative source of income for those Pakistani illiterate sanitation workers if the practice was banned? Automating the current sewage disposal system anytime soon in Pakistan was almost impossible. Workers were saving lives by providing sanitation labor, particularly in cities, but they were invisible and given no respect in the province. And most importantly, they were providing this vital service at the cost of their dignity, health, safety, and employment security without even being noticed. So the first step was how to make these invisible heroes to our society and to the world, projecting them as vigilantes of our urban lives, but without any safety gadgets. By 2019, I had seen the power of social media Still without having any expertise or technical assistance in April 2019, after talking with my close friends, and uh, I'd like to contribute here uh, to Asif Akil, who had a key role um, in providing the rationale and understanding to this caste-based discrimination, sanitation work, which is, which is in Pakistan also, just like India, a descent-based work. So this we all started this volunteer initiative, which is now known to the world as sweepers are superheroes. The very word sweeper is considered is pejorative in Pakistan. The word is full of stigma and shame. The campaign challenges the stigma by opening a debate on it by using this word sweeper. The idea was to, to show them cleaning out filth with bare hands without making any hue and cry about their heroic, horrific working conditions and hateful attitudes. The response was overwhelming and the majority of the people, they realized that they had been ignoring these heroes without noticing that somebody was cleaning their filth with their bare hands every day. Pakistan is South Asia's second most populous country with a 210 million population. Until 1947, it was part of India and governed by the British. The British introduced the modern sanitation system in these areas around the late 19th century with minor modifications. Almost all the sanitation workers come from Dalit or so-called untouchable backgrounds. Islam is the country's official religion and non-Muslims are only about 4% of the total population. However, most of the sanitation workers come from Christian or scheduled caste Hindu backgrounds across the country. Pakistan's official policy across the country is to hire non-Muslims for this work. In many places, Muslim sanitation workers get hired but refuse to work, claiming the nature of the work is ritually defiling and it hinders them from praying five times a day with all ritual purity. The state not only supports the discriminatory policies of recruiting the most marginalized and excluded communities were considered untouchables, but also pays no attention to their occupational health and safety and employment security. Our federal and provincial labor policies do not see this work as hazardous 
or consider them as vulnerable workers like construction workers or miners or agriculture workers. There are no special laws to extend ILO's decent work to sanitation workers in Pakistan. But what can be done or what we can do to make this work dignified and decent? To start with, we need to see and recognize these workers as humans. Our study shows and the recent case study, what the, the, the tragedy that happened a month ago in Sargoda, a metropolitan city in Pakistan, that they went down the sewer. They were rather forced to go down, down the sewer to save another sanitation worker. Instead of calling the rescue service, the, the other workers were called to go down. And even when they became unconscious, the rescue service came, but the rescue workers refused to go down and bring them out of this manhole. And they are not, this, this attitude actually shows that these workers are not treated as humans. They are not manholes where you can dispose of waste without thinking much. They are living humans who are forced to go down the sewer lines to clean our shit. So before extending decent work to these workers, we need to extend human dignity to these workers who have been paying the cost of our luxurious urban lives without being paid much. I'm extremely grateful to the organizers of Sanitation Workers Forum for creating this platform, an initiative for sanitation workers, a global advocacy agenda for their constant support for raising voice of sanitation workers in Pakistan. This is for the first time and and before that, whenever we, we were talking about uh, the issues of sanitation workers in South Asia, those workers were only considered from other countries like India and Bangladesh. But Pakistani sanitation workers were able to get their visibility through these platforms. And for that, I, I specifically, I owe this to uh, Mr. Anders and uh, Water Aid International, other global leaders who have paid attention to those workers and to such platforms, we have been able to give them the visibility uh, we had been yearning for so long. And I think this, this um, platform not only has provided us an opportunity to share the agony and um, horrific working conditions those workers have been working, but this has also given us a chance to see, learn from the shared knowledge other participants of this conference has done so far. And what we believe that through this understanding, through innovation and technology, we need to digitize this work and extend ILO's decent work agenda to these workers. They should be paid more. They should be uh, any superhero is no superhero without any safety gadget. So if we, if we really want to acknowledge the important work they do, the most important start would be to treat them as humans, to see them as living embodiment of what humanity stands for. And for, with that note, I would like to um, again thank the organizers and I'd like to see what if, if the audience has any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mary, for, for your speech. I think it's very, very inspiring and, and um, yeah, bringing to life some of the, the realities of sanitation workers in Pakistan. I would like to invite um, participants to either post in the chat box or use the Q&A feature or even raise, raise their hand if they want to pose question. Um, while that happens, I will take the prerogative of, of being the chair to ask you one question. Um, because I think it's it's really important, this, this element of humanization, and it also highlights the need to, which I think has also been mentioned in our sessions, the need to yeah, have all this legislative action and protective measures, but there's this wider issue of how society perceives and treats these workers. So I wanted to, to hear a bit more on, on that. Um, 
what has been the um, reaction from uh, society or from um, social media users to, to the campaign? Are people uh, pushing back or are people surprised or are people indifferent uh, or it's a mix of, of all of those? What's, what's the experience? I think to start with, it has been very, very challenging. And it has a very clear division of what the Christian community who, who mainly work in this profession and how the majority sees it. And I think this conflict is, uh, has been there since, since the beginning of this campaign. But we, we see that we are very fortunate and we owe this to the people of Pakistan, especially on social media, uh, our pages, the response has been overwhelming, honestly. I mean, uh, it was very daring for them to, to consider them. And it, if it hadn't been for social media, uh, this travel could have taken many decades to destigmatize this, this profession. But after four years, we can clearly see that calling them superheroes as it has become a thing now. And people use it in their talks and their discussions. So many documentaries have been made. So many articles have been written, which was almost, you know, their invisibility This through this through this campaign and uh, through those photographs, the archives we have been able to develop of Pakistani sanitation workers uh, has been used in different, different uh, TV talks, uh, media channels uh, for documentaries and news articles. So I think it, it shows that the, the, the negligence or the ignorance, even if not intentional, based on hatred and prejudice uh, of the society, but also the neglect uh, for taking taking their services for granted as granted, it shows that uh, there was willingness. Um, and deep down, maybe people were thinking, but they were not uh, having enough courage to say it out loud. Through this campaign, they got this courage to call them heroes, and because because word sweeper, as it, as I mentioned, it's it's seen as a derogatory term, and and the community itself don't want to use this this word because they see it as. Uh, humiliating word, but now uh, combining it with, with a quality, with, uh, uh, you know, provision of important vital service, it has also helped them to boost uh, their self-esteem. I mean, it, it, on three ways that the, the response has been different from, from community at large, uh, they, they haven't been very receptive of this idea. Sanitation workers in the beginning, they were very, very hesitant to accept that they could be seen as heroes or they could be seen as someone um, who are providing an, you know, an important service. And they were embarrassed and ashamed to share about uh, their work. They, they wouldn't be telling anyone that they were working as, as sanitation workers. It shows that there was, this is why uh, this campaign has actually destigmatized uh, uh, and that embarrassment they had, it was very, very visible. And society at large, I think, uh, although there, there is still a long way, but uh, we are, we are very, very optimistic and hopeful that uh, as the media has started taking this issue seriously on, on various um, occasions, although the visibility is still, as compared to other issues, the visibility is still very low, but social media users uh, at large, they, uh, the feedback receive, uh, the, the kind of comments, and even you know, when we uh, ran um, a survey about, about the improvement in, in our campaign, they, the recommendations and, and the interest they showed, it was immense and uh, unbelievable. Thanks, thanks, Mary, and I think, um, yeah, I think this this campaign would be an interesting case study too, because sometimes it looks like it's very difficult to change some some narratives. And I think, yeah, I, I think it's quite impressive some of the, yeah, the extent to which it, yeah, you have been able to put in the in the national discussion and in the media these these topics. I think that's a really interesting experience. Um, and but I'd like to just add to what, you know, there has been this criticism as well, that just putting on pictures, putting out pictures doesn't help. Mm -hmm. Even in our country, people say what you have done, except putting out pictures out there. Uh, but what we have actually seen that they have become part of what you just mentioned, the, the national discourse. And if some incident happens, the, the, the uh, you know, uh, 
But despite the fact, as I mentioned, that there are still some challenges, some maybe political or other uh, challenges, but people have been able to empathize. And uh, we have this survey that shows that now we have, they have become more empathetic. And now, you know, we have started uh, celebrating this Dignity Week uh, that will end on December 10th on International Human Rights Day. We are still trying to, you know, we are again trying to bring those people closer to those workers by simply pay, saying thank you. And that alone has helped them a lot. Thanks. Um, let me move to some of the questions we are we are receiving. So the first one is from the friends from the International Dalit Solidarity Network, and um, they are asking how do you think they can help to internationally visibilize the issue, and uh, what lessons can be learned from from India, which still hasn't addressed the rights of sanitation workers. Um, that's from from Mina. Uh, most importantly, thank you very much, Mina. And Mina has been a great support as well, uh, raising raising this issue. Especially, uh, our more focus, although dignity, uh, it's it's a long, long way, and we still think that it'll it'll take a, a long struggle to give them what is their due. But uh, the more focus has been on uh, stories of deaths and disease. Uh, those stories actually tell that how. Uh, you know, the, how those workers are still struggling to be treated or to be considered as, as humans, because they're, and this is, this is for the, for the first time in, in several years that people have been, have become, uh, have been held accountable um, for the negligence. Before that, you know, government officials and, you know, everybody, nobody was actually uh, taking this issue serious. But to some extent, they have started realizing that they cannot simply get away. If someone dies, it's not just, you know, a one line in news, or it's not uh, something they, they don't care about. I think Pakistan is a very, very important, you know, in a very important phase, uh, in a way that um, we, this, uh, we are, uh, we have huge commitments towards human rights, especially labor rights when it comes to our GSP plus status that is uh, contingent upon with our 27 commitments uh, on human rights and labor rights. And uh, Pakistan has uh, shown a quite good, you know, you can say that um, progress in that front. But while talking about human rights, talking about labor rights, talking about improving current labor uh, policies and frameworks, this sector is still missing. Uh, and this sector, you know, sanitation workforce is a big workforce. We still don't have, uh, you know, uh, any official data uh, from, from the government. And uh, we are still trying to see how uh, to, to, to highlight that issue with, with, the, with the EU and other uh, global partners to see that this should be put on the agenda for advocacy purposes. That is the most, I think, because we have seen things changing in other sectors too, while putting pressure uh, on the governments and uh, government authorities to, to, uh, to, to improve uh, the occupational health and safety standards. So taking this uh, sector and taking this workforce in isolation and and because there's not there isn't much work done uh with the sector i think this is a good chance and opportunity while you know we are we are talking about it with global leaders and global leaders themselves have seen uh this this uh, gap knowledge and uh, you know uh, other you know you, we have we have seen that there is there is much uh, there is need for more work in this area so I think that as the timing is very right to highlight this issue uh, with, with the EU. Mm -hmm. Thanks, that's a great pointer. Um, we have um, a, two questions from Vanita. Uh, she's uh, thanking her for the great work and she wants to learn a bit more on taking the legal route. Uh, so what, what um, for instance, for banning manual scavenging in Pakistan or uh, so if you can share the progress on, on that, or mainly in general on, on using legal, legal channels to, to, to challenge some of this discrimination. 
And the second question she has is, uh, if there is any work being done on demand for providing insurance for sanitation workers? Uh, thank you very much, Vanita. I think, again, I said, uh, this is this is very new for Pakistan. India, in that sense, is far, far ahead. And we are trying to learn what, what the scholarship has been developed because the roots are the same. The only difference is that now we have a religious element which makes this, this place more unique and complex in order to understand uh, why this the, there has been this neglect for, for such a long time. Uh, but I think the good news is that now um, you know, courts, judiciary, uh, as an, an important organ of uh, the state, has been somehow empathetic towards this issue. And we, this is what we observed in, in our uh, in last year during COVID, when when the issue of uh, you know, COVID was taken up with the court, uh, that these workers, along with other frontline workers, be provided PPE. Uh, we saw that court was the the Supreme Court of Pakistan, the highest uh, you know a judicial forum, uh, was very compassionate and ordered all provincial governments to to take special uh, interest and care of those workers. Although the, those orders were not implemented, and they still uh, need to uh, lobby to implement those orders for provision of uh, personal protective care. But this has made us realize that if, if politicians and other government agencies are not um, you know, showing much interest or they, are not, they haven't been able to provide any relief to the workers, at least there is one place where we can go. And this is why we have to, to challenge that uh, discrimination based on work and dissent uh, and making this occupation non-discriminatory we have again knocked uh, Supreme Court's door to see through this strategic litigation of uh, you know, striking down all these discriminatory policies, recruitment policies where they only require persons from uh, you know, marginalized backgrounds, specifically non-Muslims, specifically Christians or scheduled caste Hindus uh, for sanitation work. So I think this, uh, with this litigation, although it hasn't been taken up yet, but we are hopeful that this litigation will open another door to uh, encourage us. Uh, and and uh, we were also trying to take other litigation, similar litigations too, at the provincial level uh, to see mainly focusing on providing occupational health and safety uh, to these workers. Thank you. There is one question from Alex. Uh, she is asking if you have linked with other national or international sanitation workers movements. Uh, so far, we have been able to, we are trying to develop a national movement of sanitation workers, which is again, a big challenge because every sanitation agency has unions of workers. But those workers' unions actually lack representation of sanitation workers. Their representation is either none or nominal. I mean, if there, are, there is a body, a general body of, uh, you know, 15 or 20 or 25 people, an executive body, and then general body of uh, hundreds of workers from different cadres. But those sanitation, the sewer cleaners in particular, they lack representation and they are only asked to vote when the time comes. So all CBAs, collective bargain agent uh, unions, they uh, have been able to ignore uh, the, uh, the, the needs and issues of those workers. And this is what we also observed in, in this current tragedy of uh, two sanitation workers who passed away. The, the union has been trying to, instead of you know, standing for those workers, the union has been trying to uh, pressurize those workers to have a minimum compensation uh, for the deaths of those workers. So I think well, it is, it is we, we don't have any such movement like India has. India has been able to produce incredible, powerful moments, movements which have actually pressurized the governments to change or make laws. But uh, at the moment, there is need to mobilize those workers because they lack or they you know, fear losing their jobs, and that which is very legitimate. We have seen that. We did, you know, try to form a sewerman association uh, 
in Park in Lahore where we are seated, but but we have seen that the, those workers are constantly pressurized to withdraw from their demands, which are very legitimate. Um, so I think until they are given the confidence, they are, they are, uh, their capacity is built, it's still a long way for Pakistani sanitation workers to turn it into a big movement where they can demonstrate, they can, they can bargain for their rights and they can uh, seek for their basic you know, uh, pay scales and uh, uh, their, their service structure, their uh, occupational health and safety. This has never been, and interestingly, the, the uh, unions already working in Pakistan, they have only been working on, on you know, service structure. That's it. And that is not particularly, uh, you know, related to sanitation workers. Overall service structure of different cadres of uh, sanitation authorities. But, uh, so we are, we are very new to this, um, uh, to this uh, workers movement and we are trying to learn from other other places to see how we can mobilize workers uh, in order to uh, make them help, you know, fight and struggle for the rights better. Thanks. And um, yeah, that's an interesting um, point that I think we also see in, in many other, other contexts where, yeah, it's, it's a bit difficult to see what is the best or what, what channel or what form of organization might be best suited in, in supporting this these struggles of the of the sanitation workers. So definitely not unique to, to Pakistan. There is a question from Tom. He comments that um, non-cooperation was an important tool using the independence of the subcontinent. He asks, what is the scope of using refusal, refusal to clean? unless basic safety and hygiene demands are met as part of the campaign to change this mindset from sweeper to heroes. Yes, thank you very much and very, very important. Uh, I think it, it can work uh, to, be, to be very blunt, but it will take a lot of courage and time uh, for workers to realize that this, this can work. So far, they even if we have been able to sensitize them, that is very, very important. They're, 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 they are working in life-threatening conditions, although uh, their stories are heartbreaking, but still they, they haven't been able to realize that um, their, 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 you know, they, uh, their life is very valuable. And for that, they first need to demand for their uh, safety and health from from the authorities. They can now demand for for their you know salaries. They can they can uh, hold demonstrations if their salaries are not paid for like six years or more. But the the scope is very limited. If they refuse to work for one day, things will change. But it will take uh, you know a lot of effort uh, in their capacity building, in their organization and in making them understand that this is their basic human right. And although we might, be, we might have few rules and regulations on paper that they, they cannot, I mean, as I mentioned, there is the Supreme Court's judgment that no sewer man should be allowed to go down the sewer line before uh, uh, without any safety equipment. But we have seen this happening uh, throughout that this, judgment alone hasn't been implemented. So I think uh, this non-cooperation can be very, very helpful uh, if we are able to hold a, a very powerful demonstration that can be helpful, but again, depends how much we, we are investing in their unionization and mobilization and you know, uh, their uh, empowerment through, through our work, that this is what they should be demanding. I mean, one, Conflict has always been there, uh, and we are trying to break, break that taboo to that they should leave this work. That is again very controversial. They have been encouraged. They have been, you know, they have been rather forced, even by the community itself, that they should they should stop working there. I think this is this is why I think uh, we believe that this is not the solution because somebody's got to do this job. But the, the work they're doing must be paid, must be secure, decent, and uh, uh, as the work is very important, they should be paid very well. 
so this conflict also helps them to see, all right, we are doing this for our children. We want to work harder. Uh, we are earning something. So, but we will, we would want our children not to work in this profession anymore. I think this attitude has, has also, uh, so, so many workers we, we talk with, they see that whatever they are suffering and uh, the only solution of, to the end of their suffering is that if their children are, are getting educated and they get another job. That is another story that those children haven't been able to get another job other than the sanitation work. That is a whole different story. But I think the, they need to realize that quitting this job is not the solution. Whoever does this job must be respected with you know, ample security, uh, employment security, uh, occupational health and safety and uh, financial protection. This is, this is the crux. Uh, so until the workers don't, don't realize it, it will be very difficult to mobilize uh, on the agenda of dignity and safety. Thanks. Um, so we have another question. Um, it says, uh, thanks for your inspiring work. Do you have any views on how the agenda of sanitation workers can be taken forward I mean, the growing political sensitivities in several countries and the resulting shrinking space for rights-based advocacy and freedom of speech. Yes, again, a big challenge and Pakistan is no exception to that, especially, um, you know, in this current situation. And we have seen that uh, space for civil society uh, based, right-based, having rights-based approach has uh, you know uh, decreased and we we have clearly seen this over the past few years but uh, if we if we turn it into a development agenda and if we really want that because pakistan is committed and i am talking about our own context that if we are committed with sdgs if we are committed as uh, as state and as governments we we are we have seen so many um, you know uh, task force and forums for for achieving that sustainable development goal by 2025 20, now it has extended to 2030 but we we can rightly see that but in between if we are talking about you know decent work for all if you're talking about sanitation and clean drinking water for all if you're talking about health and well-being if you're talking about reducing inequalities so i think that is the most perfect agenda to, to fit in uh, and I think it should be, you know, I, I know the challenges are there, but if we are, uh, you know, if you're talking about health and well-being, if you're talking about non-discrimination, if you're talking about uh, cleaning, you know, sustainable cities, if you're talking about, um, you know, that we uh, want wash rights uh, to be extended to everyone. So these workers are the backbone of uh, wash these workers. I mean, in implementation of the broader agenda of sanitation, uh, these workers are the most vital actors. So I think uh, clubbing it with sanitation, clubbing it with wash rights, clubbing it with the um, you know uh, health and safety for all. I think this this makes us a perfect fit. It's it it only needs uh, a moderate approach. It only needs. Uh, you know some some wise approach how to how to deal with these challenges and when we are at the same time we have seen that so many uh, so much investment is coming in we have seen that in uh, urban cities so much work is being done and pakistan on one hand is very uh, receptive of innovative ideas uh, of improving quality of life so i think uh, in that all all we have to do is find the right places and pitch it um, where we find find the space. Mm -hmm. So yeah, exploring different entry points and, and adapting, yeah, strategically. Um, I have a question also if you if you could reflect a bit on um, the difference between formal and informal workers because that's something that in many countries it makes a, a quite some difference if the workers are working for the municipality or. Uh, for private sector with a contract or without a contract. I don't know um, if you have any any comments on that or any insights from the experience in Pakistan. 
I think this is very, very important and probably the, the you know, uh, the, the whole idea behind uh, providing them social security and uh, financial stability or, and employment security, this all ends up with how and, you know, by whom they are being employed. That is very, very important. Uh, the, the sanitation workers, because sanitation work is, um, is the main responsibility of the local government in Pakistan. And for that, we have municipalities. Uh, municipalities have further outsourced uh, this work to, to other agencies. So it varies. We, we still have different models of uh, sanitation systems in Pakistan, which, which we are trying to explore now. And in, with each municipality and each authority a sanitation agency, we have uh, different kind of employments. Uh, the, the most safe employment we can see so far is the regular employment. The regular employment has comparatively more perks and privileges in, in terms of deaths or injury or disease, if they get any accident, despite the fact that it's not much as compared to uh, the kind of hazardousness this work has. But comparatively, they have, uh, they have uh, you know, good salaries. But that number is... Uh, you can see that the, the second tier is of uh, daily wages. Daily wages are, uh, you know, although it's not daily wages is not informal in the technical term because informal is someone who is not employed by any regular or government authority. Uh, but these workers are, despite the fact that they are employed as daily daily wages by the government authorities, they are uh, they have the characteristics of informal labor. Uh, they are they are employed only for a month. They are paid uh, as a daily wager, so they so the salaries are very low. It becomes uh, you know even for for one person it becomes very difficult to to um, you know fulfill the means or or feed a family uh, in a month. But they, the, the, the worst part is that they are not given any compensation or they are not treated, you know, the additional, they, they do not have access to medical facilities, they do not have access to any, uh, you know, compensation. And if, if something happens, uh, in case of gassing, they, they are not, uh, you know, the regular worker has medical, you know, you know that uh, prerogative of going to the hospital and being treated and there's this limitation uh, through the social security but these workers and that number is big uh, a big number of workers employed by the municipalities or those agencies are daily wages they work only for a month they, then their contract is broken then they they are they're rehired uh, and they can work for like decades but the the one worker who died he was a daily wager the other worker who died, and that is a very good case study. We we are we are about to share uh, this on on December tenth. That how their uh, informality in this work has cost their family the legal compensation they deserved. Uh, they should have been paid, you know, equally um, because they they were doing the same work. They died doing the same job. But one was daily wager for sixteen long years. And he had went to, to the labor code for, for the regularization of his job, but he did not succeed and then he died. So I think that is very, very important in terms to understand. And, and with, with you know, workers in other municipalities, even if they are uh, daily wages, simply if they are provided you know, social security cards, things, things might be of little help for them. Although it's not the, the ultimate idea, but temporarily they can be uh, you know, uh, given access to medical, basic medical facilities, if, if there is some accident, or uh, they, you know, most of 99% uh, workers, they, they themselves said that they know that they, they are suffering from hepatitis, A for sure. And if their, their blood is screened, there'll be, uh, there'll be other diseases too, asthma, you know, um, eye infection, skin disease, it's, it's very, very common with them. But they having no medical, you know, access to medical facilities, they cannot get treated. So I think this simple act can can do wonders for them. Hmm. Thanks, thanks. Not really interesting to to understand that that situation and that, yeah, 
probably third category in the informality or fourth category in the informality scale where, where workers may be working for the municipality, but the, the format and the conditions are um, yeah, very, very informal in, in nature. Um, so I have another another question and I see um, participants have no more questions. I will I will ask mine too. Um, so there has been in the past couple of days in this in this forum some some inputs and, and some discussions on the role of uh, international agencies, um, international NGOs and, and others in this and how to make sure we are playing the the right uh, role and not um, yeah, not um, sort of occupying the space for um, yeah the grassroots organizations that are closer to the to the action. So I wanted to to hear your views on that and uh, maybe what suggestions you would have for um, this type of international organizations to to support in the in the ways that are more more helpful for your work. A very good question. And uh, as I keep saying that Pakistan is a very, very new place for this agenda. But if it hadn't been for the you know, international organizations uh, and initiative for sanitation workers, we wouldn't have been able to put it to, to the international platforms uh, like this one. Uh, the only, you know, uh, I think the only suggestion I would be having, and this is not just for this issue, but any other issue, uh, that most of the issues, especially in Pakistan's context, if you know those issues are being highlighted by the international organizations, those issues are seen as foreign agendas and foreign funded agendas. Uh, that is something we try to, you know, especially in this case, I think we, we see it as a very, very local and contextualized issue, which has, you know, taken up, which has been taken up from the grassroots level, which has some evidence, research-based evidence, and this is this is all the local local knowledge we are talking about. Um, so I think in that sense, it's very it it you know in a way it um, yeah, separates us what we hear about other other issues, uh, despite the fact that we have had a lot of you know uh, learning from India. We had a lot of learning from especially on caste based discrimination and discrimination based on work and descent from from South Asian countries and that. Uh, it's very similar to what we are suffering. But I think for international organizations, it's very important to see, and it's um, rather rare that in this case, uh, a campaign or any other work, which is not, you know, which hasn't come from the foreign, uh, it is a very local agenda. And it started from, from this local place. Uh, so I think that context is very important. And when we talk about religion, it sometimes it is seen as, we are trying to make it a religious issue, which is which is not. It automatically becomes religious when you know there is some ad out there. I mean, there was uh, an ad even yesterday saying that only non-Muslim professionals are required as sweepers. Uh, so how come we we cannot you know project it as as something that has to be non-discriminatory? Uh, so for organizations, it's very important and even people who really want to help um, sanitation workers in Pakistan, uh, they really they need to understand the context and they need to see that uh, in order, it, it would be a great support if it is put in a broader uh, labor rights perspective or sanitation, you know, as I said, that uh, uh, sustainable development goals agenda. So it fits well with that. Uh, and this is why we are trying to make it, it's not just a religious or social problem, but it's a bigger problem than that. And if we are talking about achieving such such higher goals, um, these uh, workers need to be given what is what is due. Uh, and that local context, it also varies. Uh, sometimes organizations having some limitations due to their, you know, uh, their own strategic approach, that can be one thing. But overall, if, if um, you know, if we have enough evidence, if if research is done, and uh, I think one one more important aspect is that there is need to have uh, you know that there is still knowledge gap. I mean, there's very little research. Uh, there, there's the the data we see from India is impressive. 
I mean, so many, on so many issues, we have seen that, that there has been excellent research and scholarship being built on this issue. Research we, we need in order to, you know, uh, get this issue going. I think more local knowledge needs to be built that can help better to, uh, to make people realize that this is not just a foreign uh, issue coming from the international organization for some particular uh, agenda. Thanks, thanks, Marian. Uh, I was taking lots of notes while while you were answering. I think it's it's um, yeah, it's good that it's also recorded so that um, yeah, we can all um, reflect about your your points, which are really useful. Um, any, I think we have one minute left. I don't know if there's anything that uh, you wanted to, to say that hasn't been asked, uh, Mary. Uh, I think it was it was already more than enough. And uh, if there are any questions or anything or reflections, I'd like to again, thank Sally for all her hard work. And it has been an honor to be part of that global initiative for sanitation workers. It has really boosted our confidence and, uh, it has helped us understand how these issues have been addressed in other parts of the world and how being a, a baby in this, in this uh, field, we, we, we can adapt policies and regulations and you know, laws um, in our own, own context, because all we want to do is have a more contextualized approach in order, because, because our situation is very unique, although there's some overlapping and there's some similarities, but we still need uh, to see and and of course, simply talking about them has changed things for us. Uh, people may criticize, as I mentioned earlier, that this hasn't worked or we should have done more. Yes, every one of us uh, should be doing more. But I think what we have been able to the the change we have been able to see is drastic. And uh, this is this is why I think this social media don't take it uh, for granted it can change, really change things. And it has for us. Um, so I think people who are who not just our participants, but audience at large, they have been very, very supportive um, of, of this, this campaign. And it has uh, helped us see, uh, or, or given us confidence that this work should continue. Thank you. Thanks, Mary, so much for, for your words. Um, Sally, do, do you have any announcements to, to make or are we? I um, just to say, to reiterate the thanks to Mary for joining us for this really inspiring hour. I think everyone was just listening intensely to your, to your points, um, which were fantastic. So thank you so much for joining us again at the forum. Um, and um, I will just before closing um, say to please join us everyone for the research um, agenda session, which would be at two o'clock today live with the World Health Organization. And we have some pre recorded videos as well. Um, and tomorrow morning we'll be carrying on some of the themes that Mary mentioned around labor rights and some of the labor rights violations that we see with a documentary film um, and some talks from the ILO um, and other colleagues as well. So. Please do join us for that uh, tomorrow as well. So again, thank you um, so much, Mary. Thank you to our interpreters. Thank you to our participants. And thank you also to Andres for chairing. Um, and that's it from us, I think. I'll stop recording now. Thank you.